Chapter 10 of the Grey Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sophia Otero. The Grey Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lank. The Story of Benzerdatu. There once was a king and a queen who had three wonderfully beautiful daughters, and their one thought from morning till night was how they could make the girls happy. One day the princess said to the king, Dear father, we want so much to have a picnic and to eat our dinner in the country. Very well, dear children, let us have a picnic by all means, answered he, and gave orders that everything should be got ready. When the luncheon was prepared, it was put into a cart, and the royal family stepped into a carriage and drove right away into the country. After a few miles, they reached a house, and a garden belonging to the king, and close by was their favorite place for lunch. The drive had made them very hungry, and they ate with a hearty appetite, till almost all the food had disappeared. When they had quite done, they said to their parents, now we wish like to wander about the garden a little, but when you want to go home, just call us. And they ran off, laughing, down a green glade which led to the garden. But no sooner had they stepped across the fence than a dark cloud came down and covered them, and prevented them from seeing whither they were going. Meanwhile the king and queen sat lazily among the heather, and an hour or two slipped away. The sun was dropping towards the horizon and they began to think it was time to go home. So they called to their daughters and called again, but no one answered them. Frightened at the silence, they searched every corner of the garden, the house, and the neighboring wood, but no trace of the girls was to be found anywhere. The earth seemed to have swallowed them up. The poor parents were in despair. The queen wept all the way home, and for many days after, and the king issued a proclamation that whoever should bring back his lost daughters should have one of them to wife, and should after his death reign in his stead. Now two young generals were at that time living at the court, and when they heard the king's declaration, they said to one another, Let us go in search of them, perhaps we shall be the lucky persons. And they set out, each mounted on a strong horse, taking with them a change of raiment and some money. But though they inquired at every village they rode through, they could hear nothing of the princesses, and by and by their money was all spent, and they were forced to sell their horses or give up the search. Even this money only lasted a little while longer, and nothing but their clothes lay between them and starvation. They sold the spare garments that were bound on their saddles and went in the coats that they stood up in to the inn to beg for some food, as they were really starving. But when, however, they had to pay for what they had eaten and drank, they said to the host, We have no money, and not but the clothes we stand up in. Take these, and give us instead some old rags, and let us stay here and serve you. And the innkeeper was content with the bargain, and the general remained and were his servants. All this time the king and queen remained in their palace, hungering for their children, but not a word was heard of either of them, or of the generals who had now gone to seek for them. Now there was living in the palace a faithful servant of the king's, called Benzerdatu, who had served him for many years, and when Benzerdatu saw how grieved the king was, he lifted up his voice and said to him, "'Your majesty, let me go and seek your daughters.' No, no, Benzerdatu, replied the king, three daughters have I lost and two generals, and shall I lose you also? But Benzerdatu said again, Let me go now, your majesty, and trust me, and I will bring you back your daughters. Then the king gave way, and Benzerdatu set forth and rode on till he came to the inn, where he dismounted and asked for food. It was brought by the two generals, whom he knew at once in spite of their miserable clothes, and much astonished, asked them how in the world they came there. 
They told him all their adventures, and he sent for the innkeeper and said to him, Give them back their garments, and I will pay everything that they owe you. And the innkeeper did as he was bid, and when the two generals were dressed in their proper clothes, they declared they would join Benzerdatu and with him seek for the king's daughters. The three companions rode on for many miles, and at length they came to a wild place, without sign of a human being. It was getting dark, and fearing to be lost on this desolate spot, they pushed on their horses, and at last saw light in the window of a tiny hut. "'Who comes there?' asked a voice as they knocked at the door. "'Oh, have pity on us, and give us a night's shelter,' replied Benzerdatu. "'We are three tired travellers who have lost our way.' Then the door was opened by a very old woman, who stood back and beckoned them to enter. "'Whence do you come, and whither do you go?' said she. "'Ah, good woman, we have a heavy task before us,' answered Benzerdatu. "'We are bound to carry the king's daughters back to the palace.' "'Oh, unhappy creatures!' cried she. "'You know not what you are doing.' The king's daughters were covered by a thick cloud, and no one knows where they may be now. Oh, tell us if you know, my good woman, entreated Benzerdatu, for with them lies all our happiness. Even if I were to tell you, answered she, you could not rescue them. To do that you would have to go to the very bottom of a deep river, and though certainly you would find the king's daughters there, Yet the two eldest are guarded by two giants, and the youngest is watched by a serpent with seven heads. The two generals who stood by listening were filled with terror at her words and wished to return immediately. But Benzerdatu stood firm and said, Now we have got so far, we must carry the thing through. Tell us where the river is, that we may get there as soon as possible. And the old woman told them, and gave them cheese, wine, and bread, so that they should not set forth starving. And when they had eaten and drunk, they laid themselves down to sleep. The sun had only just risen above the hills next morning, before they all woke, and taking leave of the wise woman who had helped them, they rode on, till they came to the river. "'I am the eldest,' said one of the generals, "'and it is my right to go down first. So the others fastened a cord round him, gave him a little bell, and let him down into the water. But scarcely had the river closed above his head, when such dreadful rushing sounds and peals of thunder came crashing round about him, that he lost all his courage, and rang his bell, if perchance it might be heard amidst all this clamour. Great was his relief when the rope began slowly to pull him upwards. Then the other general plunged in, but he fared no better than the first, and was soon on dry ground again. "'Well, you are a brave pair,' said Benzerdatu, as he tied the rope round his own waist. "'Let us see what will happen to me.' And when he heard the thunder and clamour round about him, he thought to himself, "'Oh, make as much noise as you like. It won't hurt me.' When his feet touched the bottom, he found himself in a large, brightly lighted hall, and in the middle sat the eldest princess, and in front of her lay a huge giant, fast asleep. Directly she saw Benzerdatu, she nodded to him, and asked with her eyes how he had come there. For answer he drew his sword, and was about to cut off the giant's head, when she stopped him quickly, and made signs to hide himself, as the giant was just beginning to wake. "'I smell man-flesh,' murmured he, stretching his great arms. "'Why, how in the world could any man get down here?' replied she. "'You had better go to sleep again.' So he turned over and went to sleep. Then the princess signed to Benzerdatu, who drew his sword, and cut off the giant's head with such a blow that it fell into the corner. And the heart of the princess leapt within her and she placed a golden crown on the head of Benzerdatu, and called him her deliverer. "'Now show me where your sisters are,' he said, "'that I may free them also.' So the princess opened a door, and led him into another hall, wherein sat her next sister, guarded by a giant who was fast asleep. 
when the second princess saw them, she made a sign to them to hide themselves, for the giant was showing symptoms of waking. "'I smell man's flesh,' murmured he sleepily. "'Now how could any man get down here?' asked she. "'Go to sleep again.' And as soon as he closed his eyes, Benzardatu stole out from his corner and struck with such a blow at his head that it flew far, far away. The princess could not find words to thank Benzardatu for what he had done, and she too placed in his hand a golden crown. "'Now show me where your youngest sister is,' said he, "'that I may free her also.' Ah, that I fear you will never be able to do, sighed they, for she is in the power of a serpent with seven heads. Take me to him, replied Benzardatu. It will be a splendid fight. Then the princess opened the door, and Benzardatu passed through and found himself in a hall that was even larger than the other two. And there stood the youngest sister, chained fast to the wall, and before her was a stretched a serpent with seven heads horrible to see as benzardatu came forward it twisted all its seven heads in its direction and then made a quick dart to snatch him within its grasp but benzardatu drew his sword and laid about him till the seven heads were rolling on the floor flinging down his sword he rushed to the princess and broke her chains and she wept for joy and embraced him and took the golden crown from off her head and placed it in his hand. Now we must go back to the upper world, said Benzardatu, and led her to the bottom of the river. The other princesses were waiting there, and he tied the rope round the eldest and rung his bell. And the generals above heard and drew her up gently. They then unfastened the cord and threw it back into the river, and in a few moments the second princess stood beside her sister. So now there was left only Benzardatu and the youngest princess. "'Dear Benzardatu,' said she, "'do me a kindness and let them draw you up before me. I dread the treachery of the generals.' "'No, no,' replied Benzardatu, "'I certainly will not leave you down here. There is nothing to fear from my comrades. It is your wish I will go up, then. But first I swear—' that if you do not follow to marry me, I shall stay single for the rest of my life. Then he bound the rope round her, and the general drew her up. But instead of lowering the rope again into the river, envy at the courage and success of Benzardatu so filled the heart of the two generals that they turned away and left him to perish. And more than that, they threatened the princesses and forced them to promise to tell their parents that it was the two generals who had set them free. And if they should ask you about Benzardatu, you must say you have never seen him, they added. And the princesses, fearing for their lives, promised everything, and they rode back to the court together. The king and queen were beside themselves with joy when they saw their dear children once more. But when the generals had told their story and the dangers they had run, the king declared that they had gained their reward and that the two eldest princesses should become their wives. And now we must see what poor Benzardatu was doing. He waited patiently a long, long time, but when the rope never came back, he knew he had been right, and that his comrades had betrayed him. Ah, oh, now I shall never reach the world again, murmured he. But being a brave man, and knowing that moaning his fate would profit him nothing, he rose and began to search through the three halls, where, perhaps, he might find something to help him. In the last one stood a dish covered with food, which reminded him that he was hungry, and he sat down and ate and drank. Months passed away, when one morning, as he was walking through the halls, he noticed a purse hanging on the wall which had never been there before. He took it down to examine it, and nearly let it fall with surprise, when a voice came from the purse, saying, "'What commands have you?' "'Oh, take me from this horrible place and up into the world again!' And in a moment he was standing by the river bank, with the purse tightly grasped in his hand. 
now let me have the most beautiful ship that was ever built, all manned and ruddy for sea. And there was the ship, with a flag floating from its mast, on which were the words, King with the Three Crowns. Then Benzerdatu climbed on board, and sailed away to the city where the three princesses dwelt. And when he reached the harbor, he blew trumpets and beat drums, so that everyone ran to the doors and windows. And the king heard, too, and saw the beautiful vessel, and said to himself, "'That must indeed be a mighty monarch, for he has three crowns, while I only have one.' So he hastened to greet the stranger, and invited him to his castle, for, thought he, "'This will be a fine husband for my youngest daughter.' Now the youngest princess had never married, and had turned a deaf ear to all her wooers. Such a long time had passed since Benzerdatu had left the palace, that the king never guessed for a moment that the splendidly clad stranger before him was the man whom he had so deeply mourned as dead. "'Noble lord,' said he, "'let us feast and make merry together, and then, if it seem good to you, do me the honor to take my youngest daughter to wife. And Benzerdatu was glad. And they all sat down to a great feast, and there were great rejoicings. But only the youngest daughter was sad, for her thoughts were with Benzerdatu. After they rose from the table, the king said to her, Dear child, this mighty lord does you the honor to ask your hand in marriage. Oh, father, answered she, "'Spare me, I pray you, for I desire to remain single.' Then Benzerdatu turned to her and said, "'And if I were Benzerdatu, would you give the same answer to me?' As she stood silently gazing at him, he added, "'Yes, I am Benzerdatu, and this is my story.' The king and queen had their hearts stirred within them at the tale of his adventures, and when he had ended, the king stretched out his hand, and said, "'Dear Benzerdatu, my youngest daughter shall indeed be your wife, and when I die my crown shall be yours. As for the men who have betrayed you, they shall leave the country, and you shall see them no more.' And the wedding feast was ordered, and rejoicings were held for three days over the marriage of Benzerdatu and the youngest princess. End of chapter 10